It's all about you, Jesus, and all this is for you, for your glory and your fame. It's not about me, as if you should do things my way. You alone are God. I surrender to your ways. <laughs> Welcome to Pitiful Church. This is our third service, so to speak. We like to call it our midday service. Kind of the time that you probably be wanting to get outside and go have a picnic. What we want to do at our midday service is we're planning on, which we still haven't done yet, is to go from the inside to the outside. You know, kind of like get out, get back to nature, or in some cases, go to the park. <laughs> Jesus had a tendency with his disciples to be found in certain locations. He had the prevalence of going to certain places. Now, admittedly, it was only about three years that he was in his ministry, about three and a half years. And to develop that, it meant that he was in a small area that people kind of got the idea of where he was going to be. You know, Garden of Gethsemane, Capernaum, or as we say in Western culture, Capernaum. <laughs> it's interesting sometimes east and west culture but the point is is this Jesus wasn't found always in the church he wasn't found always in the temple at certain times he went there specifically to fulfill prophecy but for the most part his disciples remember him with the scripture that says foxes have holes birds have their nests, but nowhere has the Son of Man to lay his head. He, when he became an itinerant preacher, he traveled throughout the land. He went to people's homes. He stayed in people's houses. He slept in caves. He camped out. He was a campfire kind of guy. He was an RV, but he was out there so the people could see who he is. If you invited him to his home, he wasn't opposed to a free meal. <laughs> Wherever he went, the guy was eating. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I like that kind of idea. That's the way we were in the Jesus movement. Hey, you got a potluck? We're going. <laughs> but we wanted to bring out this idea starting in June of get out, you know, of the box. Think outside the box. Expand your concept of God. Begin to realize that God is a whole lot bigger than you think he is. A lot of times what happens is that people start from out here and they'll begin in Genesis and they'll say, in the beginning God, and then God created the heavens and the earth, and on the first day he created this, the seventh day he created this, then he created this, then he created this, and now he can't do anything except for what he said. Well, yes and no, God is still out here and we're still in here. Sometimes you have to step outside the box in order to understand what it is that God is doing. He's the creator of the universe. i got news for you. If you haven't heard the plants sing yet, if you haven't heard creation talk to you yet, much less Jesus speak to you personally, um, you haven't fulfilled everything God intends for you. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, you know, it's nice to have technology, but that's kind of like man's idea of being a creator. God's idea of being a creator is called creation. Man's idea of being a creator is called technology. Now, don't get me wrong, I like technology. It's fun. It can be real interesting, but it's always an imitation of creation. In other words, there's nothing that man can make that God hasn't already made. God made it better. As a matter of fact, you've got probably sitting on top of your shoulders one of the best microprocessors in the world. You're not yet. And although it may not work sometimes quite the way you think it will, it's not much unlike Microsoft. 
Office <laughs> or Microsoft Processor or Windows. There we go, Microsoft Windows environment. Somehow it just kind of doesn't always work. Now maybe you should change it to a Mac or get born again. One way or the other, however you want to look at that. But the point is, the creator of the universe has so designed creation for you to enjoy that you should be learning more about it, not less. You shouldn't be arguing whether or not there is a God. You should be appreciating what God has done. When the birds sing in the morning, do you know why? Why do they sing in the morning? I mean, don't you think they would sing at night? Why do they stop at some point in time in the morning? Are they busy catching worms? I mean, why do they stop? What do they say when they're singing? Is it just a chirping of a breathing out through the nostrils or something? I mean, what is it that causes birds to sing? Now, I happen to know, and maybe you do too, and maybe the Word of God says so, but if you don't know, that might be why you need to get out of your box and begin to expand your view. You know, in camera angles, they talk about this. This is kind of like, you know, taking a camera and beginning to look at, you know, a narrow point of view. You're focusing in on something. Well, sometimes Christians get so focused in on something, they forget the big picture. And that's what we need to realize and recognize in our lives. You look from the big picture to the small picture to the personal picture to you know who who has everything in his hands. When we understand what the big picture is, it helps us with the small picture. When we know the creator, it helps us with the created. I'm one of those that he created. I know why I'm here. I know what my purpose is. I know where I'm going, how I'm getting there, and what I'm going to do when I get there. Do you? Now, I happen to personally like the idea of there being a creator who's in charge of the sunrise. Because when I look at the sunrise and I say, ah, it rose again. Cool. God's in control. Then I have an assurance that I don't have to worry about something that might not work. You know, like Microsoft or a Mac. <laughs> you know, turn the power on and it doesn't work. Oops, what happens then? Oh no, it's over. My technology isn't quite as dependable as the Creator's creation. In other words, me being a creator of some type, an imitator of the Creator, I make things that are fallible. But God, being the Creator, makes things that are infallible. So I kind of like being involved in those things that are infallible and don't put too much trust in those things that are fallible. Now, I'm fallible. So are you, and so is the pastor, and the elder, and the deacon, and the teacher, and the preacher, and you can put just about anybody there. Apostle, prophet, you know, minister, priest, you know, whatever you want. They're fallible. And because they're fallible, you have to trust in the Lord with all your heart, not in man with all your money. <laughs> I always like to throw that in because you know where man comes from. <laughs> it's about the money, honey. <laughs> Well, the old Jewish axiom, follow the money, you know, and you can see where someone's coming from. And that's true about most men. But with God, that's not true. God doesn't want your money. God doesn't want your time. God doesn't want anything about you. God says, look, I'm here. You're there. You want to be a part of my life? Great. If you don't, go to hell. I mean, that's what it's boiled down to. You're going to hell if you don't get involved in you know whose life? God's. So if you want to be involved in eternal life, you have to deal with the eternal one who gives it. You know, the sun, kind of like what's shining over here, you know, bright, you know, like, wow, hey, God, how you doing? Hey, you got a good bright one today. It's like you have to come to the light as he is in the light, because he is going to reveal your life. And I know if you're like me, you don't really want your life reveal but you want to kind of keep it in that narrow box where you can kind of like stuff stuff here and stuff stuff there and kind of stuff things under the rug you know keep things out of sight so that they're not in sight so that people don't know whether you're wrong or whether you're right because you like to be right don't get me wrong everybody likes to be right everybody likes to be in the know and not be stupid you know but the bottom line is the creator of the universe knows when we're right and when we're wrong he knows when we're 
out there to be seen and when we really shouldn't be seen, but we need to repent or we need to change our ways. We need to do something different because we didn't do it quite right. We didn't do it the way he might have said to do it. We invented our own way. We came up with our own creation. And that's what happens a lot of times when you stay on the inside as opposed to getting on the outside. Because you see, when I look at creation, I can see creation under a curse. I'll admit, you know, there's rose bushes that are thorny. There are certain plants that don't bloom as fully as they could. And I have a lot of them in my porch. But even in those areas where they don't bloom yet, I see the beauty of how God created them to be. And even though you haven't necessarily bloomed yet fully of what you're meant to be, I can see the beauty of what God is doing in you. And God is working both to do and to will of his good pleasure in all of creation. And in all of the universe, God is at work both to do and to will of his good pleasure. That may not be nice to you if you're kind of rebellious. You know, if you've got this attitude like Satan had of kind of like, you know, it's all about me. And that, hey, I'm here for myself. Well, yeah, you know, you can be there for yourself. You can. But God didn't say that's why you're here. He said, as a matter of fact, I made you to be offering to me your gratitude. Yeah, seriously. If you're not giving thanks for what you got, you're going to lose what it is you have. And then when you find out that God wanted thanksgiving from you daily, um, and you didn't do it, uh, he may just kind of like go, bye-bye, and, you know, cast you away. As a matter of fact, that's what Jesus said would happen. So that's kind of why we got to get outside the box and get back with the program. We need to take a walk, take a talk, take a time to get outside of religion, to look back inside of our faith. Because faith isn't about religion. Faith is about having something you're putting your trust in or someone and you're having a relationship with that person so that you don't have to have a mystical maybe what if experience but you're having a personal dynamic an interaction an action and a reaction with god god is working in you you are working with him he is coming upon you he is working through you he is talking to you matter of fact when I like to get a clear word from God, I go for a walk. I go for a walk and talk. You know, you know what a walk and talk is? It's kind of like having a walkabout that they talk about in Australia. You know, walkabout is you kind of like, you know, you've been so stressed out, you know, at your job that you just kind of like, fine, I've had it, I'm out of here. And you go on a walkabout for a couple of years. You know, you kind of get your head on straight. You know, you kind of do a evaluate. Some people call it a sabbatical, you know, which is a good word. It means to rest. But a sabbatical is to take time away from your academia or your academic world or your learning process and to just rest, to go someplace, usually a foreign country or, you know, some other remote location to get away from it all. Some people call it a vacation in America, but there's like in the old days, it was called a sabbatical or a walkabout. Some people, when they face death, they realize, uh, my job's not that important, but now I realize what really is important, and I think I want to go visit some of my friends. And they go spend some quality time with family or friends. They go to do a long distance, maybe, visitation, you know, kind of like going places to see things and do things they never would have done, except for they just found out they don't have much time to live. <laughs> Funny how that wakes you up. Wake up, call. But God gives us a wake-up call in His Word. He says, look, follow thou me. You know, don't worry about what others may do. Don't worry what others may say. You follow me. Peter had gotten carried away about some of the things that he was learning. He had gotten kind of like, you know, he always kept wanting to organize things. I don't blame him. You know, he's kind of like the captain of the ship. You know, he wanted to be in charge. The dude, you know, had a vocation. He was pretty confident of his ability to fish pretty strong in the arm, you know, he was like a man's man, and he was always shooting off his mouth and saying something was wrong, and right, and wrong, and right, just like most of us. But what God wanted to do was to take him beyond himself. God wanted him to work outside of Peter. Peter, God wanted to change 
to be more like Jesus, who wasn't so focused on himself, but was focused on what his father was doing. Now, we want to take something like that and apply that at our midday service. We want to go outside to bring inside the Word of God. We're going to start recording our midday service up the mountain and outside so that we can enjoy the grass, the park, the picnic. We might even take a little, you know, Kool-Aid or maybe some wine, we don't know. Kool-Aid, wine, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, whatever it may be. But we're going to have a picnic at midday. We're going to have a celebration, as it were, a time to get away, to get outside the church, to say, hey, you know what? Let's have a Sunday go to meeting kind of like thing, but outside the doors where we don't need to have the sound system. We don't need to have the church. Matter of fact, if we want to have a sound system, we'll just bring our little PDAs. Oh, we don't do PDAs anymore. Okay, we'll bring our smartphones. We can just watch our smartphone and have our little worship thing, you know, plug in our little earbuds and just, hey, stick it in your ear. That's kind of like, you know, I almost feel like Satan's using technology in some ways because, in a way, that's what a lot of people do, don't they? Instead of listening to God, maybe, you know, I mean, you can hear God in technology. Don't get me wrong. I think it's a wonderful thing. My wife listens to, to uh, every day, a Bible reading by, I think it's uh, Bob Dooley, and she sticks it in her ear. <laughs> her earbuds, that is. <laughs> Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. It applies. So, you don't have to have, you know, all these expensive ways of having a church. Matter of fact, church was meant to be really you and God. It's meant to be even personal where you don't have to have 10,000 people around you, you know, making you feel good by mass appeal. Sometimes the masses are what it's all about. I don't want to go to mass, so I don't go to mega churches. you know, kind of like a Catholic crossover evangelical kind of way of looking at mass, you know. If I wanted to be a Catholic, I'd have stuck with the mass. If I want to be evangelically like the mass, I go to a mass of people and somehow it's just like, eh, that's not really where I'm at. I like to be intimate. Personal, you know, I know the guy sitting next to me, you know, he's Jesus. And I know the person sitting on the other side of me, it's the Father. And I know the person inside of me, it's the Spirit of God. So, we're going to go on this journey this summer and then into the winter of being outside the church at our midday service. We want to have that ability to say, look, it's not about really looking at buildings, ideas, structure, kind of like, you know, philosophical, you know, kind of like when it sits inside of a boardroom meeting, this is the kind of thing that we talk about. Uh-uh. I want to meet you where you're at, where you live. I want to talk to you about what God does when he says, look, I stand at the door and knock. You come follow me and I'm going to open the door. We'll eat. And we'll sit down and we'll talk. We'll walk. We'll have a real relationship. And that's what I want for you to experience. I want you to come with me and to see if Jesus will meet us up the mountain. I want you to come on up the mountain and not dwell in the valley below. I don't want you to be stuck in your technology, lost in your sound system, always paying your dues, as it were, on a Sunday morning, but getting out into the light, getting bright, getting right, getting with Jesus today so that you can have that personal relationship that you know the Bible said so, but you haven't seen it yet. You haven't seen it or proved that it's true for you. Me, hey, I'm all about it. I'm all like, hey, let's go down the street. Let's go up the street. Let's go down to Salt Lake even. Let's go have a baptism in the very Salt Lake itself. You know, forget these stupid ideas people come up with. Well, we got to have a tub. You know, well, we got to have this, uh, we got to go to a water park. Well, you know, we got to go to this little aquatic center. What happened to the lake? Come down to the lake, the muddy, dirty, kind of like salty little thingy down there. You know, that's huge where everybody could see you, you know, and let's go have a real baptism. <laughs> that's where I'm at. So that's what we're doing at midday service. We're thinking outside the box, but we're thinking outside the church. As a matter of fact, we're going outside the walls and we're getting rid of this so that we can get more of this. How about it? You want to go there? Then check us out on midday, because midday we're always going to be there with a picnic. We call it our picnic service because it's kind of the time that we want to pick a nick up. You know, I don't want to pick a fight with you. I want a picnic, you know, where we eat, where we enjoy, where we pick just a little bit of word, but we take a lot of food. <laughs> Wherever we're at, we're going to have food. And so my wife and I are going to do that. We're going to go up the hill and start to record what we find there. Begin to enjoy what maybe is a quiet time. 
a less stressful time, a less, oh, well, we got to do our worship, we got to do our prayer, we got to do our evangelism, we got to do our salvation message. You know, we got to do. We're going to get rid of the do because at noon, we want to do the rest. You know, be at peace, be full of love, begin to be still and know that He is God. Back in 1994, uh, my wife and I, we got married and two weeks after we got married, I just looked at my wife and I said, you know, I'm just, I'm tired of church. I'm tired of the fighting that goes on. I'm tired of not knowing where the money goes. I'm, I'm starting to question a lot of the, the professionalism. Like it, it seems more like a concert than it is like a worship service. And, and I just remember asking her, I go, don't you want something different? because I do, and I, I said, I'd love to just gather some people in our, in our living room and just, just pray with them, to study the Bible together and, and just have a sense of authenticity. Not, not that everything else was bad, it's just I, I longed for something different and, and, and I just questioned maybe some of the professionalism, maybe some of the details uh, caused us to maybe get diverted from the original intention. And I told her, I, I don't really care if I'm a professional pastor. I'll wait tables, I'll do whatever. I just really long for this expression of church. And as we began to pursue it, it was, it was a beautiful thing, but, but pretty soon it grew larger and larger to where we needed a building and then a larger building and then multiple services. And, and I think we did our best. We did our best in trying to teach everything the Bible taught, whether it was popular or not. We, we, we tried to be authentic in our worship and really sing to Him. We, we were trying to be very careful and open with all the finances, but at the end of the day, we neglected some pretty important things, um, such as love one another, which is only the second greatest command in all of scripture, but we, we were doing a lot of things right. We just realized, I think we're missing it still. I think there's more. And, and as we evaluated, it was a lot more painful this time because now I didn't have anyone else to blame. Now I noticed how we had neglected some of the important things in scripture. And I think we all see it. I, I, I think that anyone that has any type of church experience looks at the Bible and they look at what they're experiencing and they're going, why not today? Why couldn't we do that today? And, and as we do that, it's, it's the church becoming more and more, I believe, what God called it to be. And in fact, I think if God showed me everything and said, look, here's everything you're doing wrong, I think we would have been paralyzed. It may have been overwhelming. And the important thing is to remember, no, you know what? We can do this. God wants us to do this. Let's keep finding what's unbiblical and move toward a more and more biblical pattern because it's not that difficult. And I think it's something that a lot of us long for. We 
can fool ourselves thinking, you know what, at least we're doing something. And something is always better than nothing. But I would challenge that because I look in scripture and there are times when the church was just missing it and God says, it'd be better for you just not to do anything than to do that. For example, when you come to this idea of the Lord's Supper or communion, I mean, Paul makes some pretty strong statements in 1 Corinthians 11. He goes, you know, when you guys get together to practice this thing that you call the Lord's Supper, he goes, that's not even remotely close to what God wanted. He goes, in fact, some of you, it would have been better if you didn't show up, that you didn't break bread together. This is something we really had to wrestle with because we're going, okay, what was the Lord's Supper like back then? What was communion? What was God's intention? Because I don't want to just assume that because we got a bunch of people in the room and we took bread and we took the cup that we're, we're, we're actually practicing the true Lord's Supper. And so we, we, we looked at scripture and in Acts 2, it says the early church devoted themselves to the Lord's Supper this breaking of bread. And then it says that they went house to house breaking bread. Has it ever bothered you that you've never done that? Has it ever bothered you that the only way you've ever taken communion was in this big room with a bunch of people facing forward and, and you've never gone house to house breaking bread? In fact, it would be awkward for you to do it that way. Do you understand when, when Jesus instituted communion, it was such an intimate and beautiful picture. In fact, Jesus, when he gathered his disciples together, he looks at them and he goes, ah, oh, I've longed for this moment. Jesus was about to die on the cross and he goes, I just long to get my friends together. And there was a, there was a relationship there. And then he looks at his friends and he says, my body's gonna be broken for you. My blood is gonna be spilled out for you and, it's, it's, and this cup is gonna represent that. And, and, and he says, so when you break this bread, I want you to remember my body that was broken for you. Because when you take this cup, remember my blood that was shed for you because this is what the forgiveness is gonna come from. And there was, a, there was an intense moment in there as he explained what was about to happen. And he says, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. This is the most amazing thing that anyone will ever do for you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone lays down his life for you. And I don't want you to forget this. And so every time you break the bread, remember my body. Every time you drink this cup, remember my blood that was shed for you and do this to proclaim my death until I return. I, I, I look at all of this and I go, wow, wouldn't that be beautiful if that's the way everyone did communion and to recognize that's the way it was supposed to be. And, and I've heard so many people say to me, that's crazy, you'll never change it. You know, we've, we've created this thing and it's, 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 all, it's almost like we've got to deal with it, like, like nothing can change. And I'm going, is it really that difficult? I, I know it would be awkward, maybe the first time to just sit your family down and after the meal to break a piece of bread and say, let's remember his body. I know it'd be awkward if you're out to dinner with a bunch of friends and you just say, hey guys, let's, let's remember what, what, what binds us all together but it was a beautiful thing. This, this was awesome. You, you guys are the ones I know. You guys are the ones that I trust. You guys are the ones that I love and I know that, that we're all focused together. And it's a beautiful thing in God's eyes. It's a, it's a devotion. And when I, when I look at that whole church scene back there, I go, it seems a lot easier. Now the commitment is larger, but it's simpler. We don't have to have a giant building. We don't have to have all the lights and all the salaries and all just the, the craziness of all these details. And maybe some of that's even diverting us. I'm not saying it's all wrong. I'm just saying, is it really impossible to go back to a simpler form of church? And isn't there something in us that actually longs for that?
While this type of gathering is, is more basic, there's a scary side to it. I mean, in the old way, you, you could hide. You, you could attend a service and, and, and maybe help out in the nursery and maybe even sing in the choir. And then, then during the rest of the time, you could build your own kingdom and live your own life. But what we're talking about here is a commitment. It's about 24-7. It's about being a part of something being a part of a mission always. It's about gathering with a group of people who, who really fear God, who, who don't just say they believe in him, but they understand he's a holy God and that he gives us every breath that we have. And it's, and it's this idea of we, we gather together because we all agree he's someone we ought to fear. And, and it's gathering with a, with a, with a people group who, who understand that Jesus called us to follow him to really live for him. And that's not just praying some prayer, or making some decision, but it's about a lifetime of literally following him and becoming like him. It's gathering with people and saying, we're tired of just the natural and just doing things we know to do. We wanna experience the Holy Spirit. We wanna follow his leading and keep in step with him. It's, it's a group of people that are committed to fellowship, a, a, a true sharing, a sharing of everything because this mission is so important to us. And so we get together and we study this book together. We study it, we live it out, we, we encourage each other to live it out nonstop. And when we pray, we gather together and we're united because we know each other. We love each other. We've shared with each other. And together, God sees his children bonding together to pray for the things that he desires. And then when we gather and we actually break bread and remind each other of the most important thing in our lives, there's something so powerful about that. And the beautiful thing is that by God's Spirit, He puts this desire in our hearts where I want this, you want this, because it's something that God is doing. Jesus said that He's gonna build His church. And the question is, is do you wanna be a part of it? To stop attending and to really be the church, the true church.